Welcome back, friends. We're talking about Francis de Salle. So briefly, very briefly, uh, skimming over his bio. Um, he was born into an age of teaching. Um, at 19 years of age, he had a full liberal education. Um, he dressed finely, gentlemanly, and he had a crisis of faith. He peered deeply into God. And like and Sarah brought up Augustine last time, and very much like Augustine, he realized that God exists and that God does not change. And he had gotten into this crisis because of predestination. God is in charge of everything. I mean, you know, he's in charge of everything, but if we don't go into predestination too heavily. But in any event, he finds Aquinas, who will counter that our Lord is immutable. He doesn't change. He has always existed, you know, the uh, five proofs of the existence of God. So you love, there's not, you know, you can you trust him, um, that he loves you. He'll love you even in hell. He loves you. And um, so then he formed a a complete act of trust from this crisis. He prayed the memorari every day. And uh, as Aquinas is known as the angelic doctor, DeSales is known as the doctor of love. Mm -hmm. So he would be approached by the rich and the poor like how to develop this love of God. And so he uh, wrote the introduction to the de- uh, the devout life. So let's t- define our, t- what is devotion? And it's that ability within the person to be agile, have alacrity, charity uh, is your ultimate end. It's a devotion versus love. Um, Thomas Aquinas would use the marriage as, you know, or if, if you have a beloved and you sense that they like chocolate, they don't even have to tell you, you see a chocolate. They, you, you go and get the chocolate bar and you bring it back and it's just, it's just wonderful. Or, you know, my dear husband, he knew I was busy one day. He saw the towels needed to be hung up. And he just was so happy to do that. And he wanted to be quick about it because he knew I'd come along and help him. And there is devotion. Like that's a, that's a, a devoted type of love. Um, it's a state of grace. It strengthens to do good charity. It's uh, being in love um, with joy and alacrity. It's a virtue with a firm disposition to the good. And it's almost unconscious uh, in the actions that soul has, you, because you're discerning the so so to Christ, you discern what His desire might be, even before you know you, you know that fleeting thought of uh, giving the five to the person at the who needs it at the filling station or whatever. Because you know that Christ would do it. You just, just, just leaves. Right. Yeah, it's really a a profound difference of, to to love is, is, is 100% um, within the will, right? You, you can make an ascent of reason to love, but it's as though devotion is the sweetness Yes, yes, yes. It bursts into flames. Right. It, you know, it's like the hug, and then there's there's that element behind the hug that's the warmth. It's like you can't articulate the warmth, but we've all been hugged by people who like us and by people who love us and by people who are really strongly devoted to us, right? I mean, there's, there is something there that is uh, an inexpressible essence but it's truly tangible you you know it when you see it um and what i find so beautiful about saint francis de sales is that he's capable of bringing people into that that sense 
through through words. You know, you you read him and you you feel that warmth. It is it is a really interesting. He's a really interesting author from that standpoint, because I think very few people are able to read um, Saint Francis. Like when you when you read Saint Thomas Aquinas, and I take nothing away from Aquinas because they were writing two different types of books, um, and and Aquinas has much that is beautiful in terms of his poetry, but it is didactic. Uh, in in a in a systematic kind of way that you can make an engagement uh, of of the intellect with him, um, and you can still make an engagement of the intellect with uh, with Saint Saint Francis de Sales, but it's almost impossible for it not to touch the soul. Yes, and that'll be some of the, some will some will posit that that's why <laughs> Aquinas. Wayne so often is because he doesn't have the stories or the, right, maybe. the yes. personal he is you know ABC. and right. some find that dry and hard mm -hmm. and and that sort of thing some will do right. that so to cells so let's get on so how do we de develop this devotion to our blessed lord and he starts uh, right off the bat with prayer. And he is, so you're going to hear, so here's a, an Aquinas approach. He's going to note the problems. So that'd be the objections. Okay, right. I want to pray, but these are my objections. Um, first, it needs to be regular. So the first objection is always time. And mm -hmm. as with anything that's important, prayer must have its pride of place in the schedule. And busy Bishop Francis de Sales suggests the morning hours when the soul is most refreshed and when you have uh, more charge of your schedule. Stick your prayer there. Okay. He will say perseverance is also essential. And as with any endeavor, the soul is willing, but the body is weak. So perseverance is aided when we're not. And so here's to Sarah's statement. Do not be too severe with our wandering minds during prayer. Our good intent, and I found I have found this concept so consoling. Our good intention is the primary consideration rather than a sustained meditative prayer for over an hour. So let me say that again. We have the best of intentions for prayer. We're sitting there. We're saying our or we're doing whatever prayer practice um, we think is ought we ought to do, and our mind starts wandering here, there, and everywhere. And he's saying, "Don't take your, don't be too severe." Our Lord knew what we really, we really did want to have a good prayer time with them, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, your presence matters, you know, because it's very easy for us to rationalize ourselves away from prayer because we get distracted. Oh, I just can't ever keep myself focused. So I just, I just, you know, I, I should probably just go and take care of those things. No, if you've committed to something, and I'm, I'm not good at this. I, I mean, I'm certainly not patting myself on the back uh, in any way, shape, or form. But there is everyone, everyone understands the concept that slow and steady wins the race. You know, it is a, a, a commitment. I, it's funny because I was just talking to, I'm teaching this French class, and I was just talking to my students yesterday about how when I presented to them their homework from last week, all of them, you know, I think their heads a little bit exploded. Um, and then we went through our class again yesterday. And what I was telling them is you can't expect success today, right? I mean, St. Francis de Sales never proposed that by by doing one hour of devotion that you were going to become devoted. He's he's asking us to engage in this as a lifetime love affair with our Lord. And and each day that you do it, right, each day that you're faithful to that time, you can't help but grow in devotion if you are faithful. Our Lord can't our Lord can't be outdone in generosity. So if you give our Lord 15 minutes a day for the rest of your life, I I I mean I, I Gosh, I mean, I wish that I did. <laughs> I, I think about how beautiful that might be. Like I think to myself, you know, if you practice piano 15 minutes a day, honestly, mm -hmm. 
you would be you would have uh, you would have a, a really beautiful piece at the end of the year to show. That's correct. That's right. Our minds do wander and our spirit is tied to the bodily distractions, but that should not cause the soul to lose heart and regular prayer. And here comes that humility, right? He said, let's, uh, what were the, let's take a look. Patience, humility, and meekness. And that's where humility comes into play because we know who we are and we approach the merciful father and entrust it itself, the soul to his love. All right. So we have prayer. Second big topic, holy mass, mm -hmm. preferably every day. Mass is the highest form of prayer. And he makes an interesting uh, distinction. He says it's the ma mass not necessarily receiving communion, which is the highest prayer. Um, Jesus, because of who is speaking and who is being spoken to. Jesus Christ is speaking to his father. So it's God to God. And the mass is the prayer of dialogue on the cross. So that's why he will say that's the, the highest um, by his action of dying for us and dying on the cross is the prayer to the father. So the mass is that rep representation of that prayer offered by the son to the father, offering whole of himself in obedience because someone asked it, the father, out of love. So that's why he will see the holy mass in its own totality right it's it is interesting to me um that people <laughs> i don't know i don't quite know how to articulate this but that people now see the mass as only uh as only receiving the eucharist and everyone goes to the eucharist to receive without any level of, well, I shouldn't say anyone, but many people go without any level of introspection. They just go because it's it's habituated in them. It's habituated them to receive communion. But we have lost the sense that this is a dialogue uh, amongst the divinity, right? Amongst our, amongst God himself, God speaking to God. Um, and I, you know, it, it, there is an element to devotion that requires a giving without receipt. There is something there that I think St. Francis de Sales understood far better than maybe even later popes. And I, I, I don't, and that's what I'm saying. I mean, I don't want to be misunderstood. Receiving communion is, is a tremendous gift that are, that is given to us. But perhaps we've swung the pendulum a little bit too far in terms of that now it's almost a reflexive action without without any you know it's almost instinct as opposed to uh a, a, an entering into relationship with god um so and i i think that saint francis de sales uh that is that's an area that's really worthy of recollection because I find for myself, and I don't know if it's the case for you, I don't really have a good understanding of how to discern when not to receive communion. Mm -hmm. I don't, because it, it, it almost feels like there's a, there's a wrongness there. And yet there is a goodness to the mass to just be in the mass. Um, Anyway, I, perhaps he'll will come across something more in his writings that will enlighten that. Yes, perhaps. Yes, so we'll be on the lookout for that. Okay, mm -hmm. my friends, let's pick up with. So we're still on this big topic of prayer, private prayer versus community prayer in the next episode. Till then, my friends, be they sadrachia.